people that I dealt with. John has been very quiet. I have been. I've been taking it in because um, I'm a little more out of my element with Homer than I am with Plato and Aristotle. But I was thinking just what you said, Carl. I, I don't quite know if in high school I knew of anybody with the rage of Achilles that could be so <clears throat> strong. You didn't have anybody like rage quit the high school band? I, I, I was not in the band, so I couldn't tell you. Many such cases. Quiz bowl. I, I'm not going to do this anymore. The hell with you. I hate you, Dad. You know, uh, I don't know. Maybe it was my high school. Uh, I guess maybe you could think of it as I certainly know people with anger. That's not always justified. But Achilles experiences a rage that does seem justified. Uh, and that is probably. Mm-hmm. One of the hardest things for us to wrap our heads around is he experienced such a great rage. Uh, and I didn't think of it till you reread the opening lines that Homer doesn't start with saying he sent the souls of uh, Trojans down to Hades. It was Achaeans, his own men, that his rage killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty startling beginning for a supposed hero. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, I was doing a little digging. Um, the word for rage is manus, which is the root of the English mania. Uh, and it's not, at least in my, re- my rereading of book one, it's not the word in Greek that's used for other people that are angry. When Agamemnon is angry, it's a different word. Hmm. However, when Apollo is angry, it's manus. There's something different about Achilles' anger. He's not just fed up. Angry, rage might not be the best translation, but I don't know what else you would do in, in English. Um. As you, you point that out, I'm thinking, uh, I did not pick up until this reading the parallels between Agamemnon, uh, sorry, Achilles and Apollo both of whom serve kings whom they have problems with. Uh, But Mm -hmm. for you to note that linguistic connection, that really helps to solidify how strong a tie there might be between the two. Oh, gosh, there's so many parallels in here. Uh, Interesting parallels, uh, which we can get to. So maybe we ought to get to the plot. Maybe we should talk a little bit about what it is. It's it's a poem. It doesn't rhyme. It's uh, it's in ancient Greek. Uh, It's in Homeric Greek. But it has a pretty strict meter, a six-foot meter with, with it's called dactylic hexameter. You don't need to go into too much detail. Um, in Greek, it's got this rhythm that just keeps driving and driving and driving forward for 24 books. Um, when you pick a translation, unless you learn the Greek, which you could do, it's, it's not impossible, you could do it. Uh, you pick a translation, you have to choose between literalness and poetic value and uh i don't know i have fagels in front of me i have Lattimore in front of me and i have pope open in a tab oh boy they all do it differently let's talk about the meter okay yeah let's talk about that um i'm not reading it in meter i'm not i'm reading the fagels uh and i'm missing a lot because of that but I don't speak and read Greek. I think even if you read Greek, you know, John has a lot of Greek. If you're not speaking this, if you're not hearing it out loud, that meter, that meter's not doing us all the good it could. But even though most of us, and including our readers at Online Great Books, aren't getting that, I think it's something that needs to be talked about. It's the di- it's dactylic hexameter. So a dactyle yeah. is um pa pa. It's got three pieces, mm-hmm. and because it's a hexameter. Let me give a, a hint. So, dact- dactyl is a word for finger. If you hold your first finger up, and uh, it's a long, short, short. If you look at the length of your, are they metatarsals, metacarpals, whatever those bones in your finger, you have that first long bone and then the two shorts, and that tells you what that that foot looks like. It just looks like your finger, like your dactyl. 
Yeah, it's I don't a, know if that helps anybody, but it's lo- cool. Long, short, short. Um, pa, pa. And it's hexameter. So there's hex. There's six in that meter. And um, because it does um, pa, pa six times before it resets, the thing just, it just has this driving nature. And uh, it's relentless. Relentless, relentless. And it, and that meter gives Homer <clears throat> or the Homers or whatever um, room to use re, r- room to use um, some phrases over and over again. So you'll see uh, you'll see um, uh, r- the r- rosy hipped dawn. Rose, depending what translation, you'll see these repeated phrases over and over again. And if you if you think about this and realize that it was it was almost a song, and it was done, it was recited uh, live in meter, and that there are refrains in this in this that that fit with the meter. So when you read about swift footed Achilles and you see swift footed Achilles over and over again, you know these these are these are the hooks in the song that would, that would keep, that would help keep, uh, this, this, I don't know, audience engaged. And, um, uh, even though I'm not reading in a meter, I find all those things comforting, you know, swift footed Achilles. I mean, that's who he is. Um, yeah. So it was Milman Perry who <coughs> gave us out. Um, was, was, say that again. For extra credit, you can go look up Milman Perry. Hmm. Milman Perry was a scholar who figured this out. He, listened to, I think, uh, Yugoslavian epic singers, because there were still singers of epics in those days. And uh, when somebody does epic poetry, nobody does it anymore, or very few people. But you've got the story, and somebody says to you, why don't you do the Rage of Achilles? Or why don't you do, um, I don't know, throw out a topic, and they have to, on the spot, come up with a sung, rhythmic poem out of their store, out of the, the, the poets or the rhapsodes uh, storehouse of, of uh, myth and story. And he's got to make it hit the meter. And if it's Homeric, you cannot screw up the dactylic hexameter. And so if you are, you know, a certain number of feet from the end of the line, you've got to say, po de socus Achilleus, swift-footed Achilles. Or you might say, dios Achilleus. You, know, you might say it uh, divine Achilles. You might say son of Peleus. Whatever you need to do to get to the end of the line. So it might sound to you a little bit forced in English, but realize this is a master poet. And I, I hate to say it because I'm not a huge fan of the art form, but the closest thing to it now would be freestyle rap, where people are making up poetry on the fly, and they'll have similar patterns. If you make a study of it, you'll find there are similar patterns in that art form that they use to get to the end of the line. Carl. Homer, however, being a uh, super genius. Carl, I'm getting messages that say yes. that you need to turn up your volume. How do I turn up my volume? I don't know the answer to that. Don't you have a preamp? I don't know. <clears throat> see what I can do. Is this better? I don't know. They're texting me because I don't have uh, chat. Let me see what I can do. Uh, now, where was I? I was just on a crescendo to a point. Uh, on rap. <laughs> rap and Homer. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me see if I can. Do I have levels? Let me do manual. Mic gain. I will turn it up a little bit. Is this better? Do you think? Keep what talking. What do you think, internet audience? Can you guys still hear me? I can hear you fine. Car- uh, Todd okay, says no. He says no. He wants it even louder. Yeah. Oh. This is about as loud as I can go. Okay. Thirty-six decibels. Say lobby. Let me go to audio settings. Input level. Hmm. That's as good as I can do. Should I shout? I don't know. My. I mean, I, I noticed the difference in my headphones, but I'm not sure how that's translating to streaming. Well, we'll do the best I can. I, I'm getting a little distortion on my end, so we'll try it. Um, Homer being a genius. 
uh, and I, I really mean that, that word's thrown around, but, you know, some poets said even Homer nods. I think that's a lie. Homer never nodded. Homer meant every word that he said. And if you don't understand it, it's your problem, pal. Well, okay, so there's swift-footed Achilles. It gets used a few times. It, get, you, it gets used when the Achaeans are stuck in their camp, dying of plague. We'll talk about that in a minute. Swift-footed Achilles calls up the meeting. Well, he's not running, but that refers to his character uh, when they come to see him in Book 9 in the embassy where he's sitting in his lodge doing nothing. Again, you get swift-footed Achilles. I believe in the end, spoiler, when he is weeping the death, weeping at the death of his friend, you know, on the ground, clawing at the dirt, uh, and his mother comes to talk to him. Again, it's swift-footed Achilles. There are contrasts. There's a bit in book six where Hector of the Shining Helmet that's one of his epithets. I mean, you have to notice the helmet. It, I, I don't want to spoil that for you. But, uh, the helmet's a big deal. And Homer makes use of this rhythmic device that's necessary in order to do this kind of poetry and does it uh, wonderfully. For me, it's a lot like if you listen to Mozart. Mozart doesn't do anything that Salieri doesn't do. You know, the classical music of the time, they have all of the same conventions, but it's different from Mozart. When he does it, it's better. If that makes sense. How's my level? Make a difference and... Uh... I don't know what else to tell him. Yeah, I'm going to take it down just one notch because I'm getting distortion here. I don't want to distort. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of mastery going on. There are also uh, – the rhythm is just so cool. When you get to it, all I can – imagine a drum beat going thump, 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 thump. For 24 books, while the story is going on, while the tension is building up, you know, you're, you're at the concert and uh, um, you hear the drums start, you know, and imagine the experience. This is not just an intellectual, let me read an old Greek book, you know, you want to try to get into what it was like to experience it. You know, it's appealing to your senses and it's appealing to you in a metrical way. Um, I, I, I don't know how to get you to do that. Uh, in an English translation, it's going to be hard. Uh, I want to read, let me read four lines or so of Alexander Pope. So Pope did a verse Iliad, a metrical Iliad. He did it in, I think, iambic pentameter. <coughs> yeah, so Shakespearean verse which is much easier in English than dactylic. All right, here goes. <clears throat> Achilles wrapped to Greece the direful spring of woes unnumbered, heavenly goddess sing, that wrath which hurled to Pluto's gloomy reign the souls of mighty chiefs untimely slain, whose limbs unburied on the naked shore, devouring dogs and hungry vultures tore. Since great Achilles and Atrides strove, such was the sovereign doom, such the will of Jove. Well, in one way, that in, pardon me. In one way, that's more like what it would have been like to hear the actual Homer perform this thing. And another, it's not quite literal. Yes, I hadn't. So you pick your poison. <laughs> I hadn't read this in quite a while, and in my mind, when I when I when I think of the Iliad, I've, I I've realized on reading Fagel's that in my mind I'm thinking of the Fitzgerald Iliad and um, <clears throat> that brought up the question for me you know am I actually reading the Iliad well you're doing the best you can 
you know, they're, you're trying to experience this great work of art in the way that you can. Um, you know, it, it, if you want to experience a great painting, you can look it up in a book. You can look for the scan on Google. You can go see it in its environment. That would be the ideal. But even then, you know, if I want to go see an El Greco, I saw an El Greco in Spain in the cathedral or was, in which it was painted. And it was it was very neat. It was much different. I, I I didn't like El Greco very much. It was all weird. But you see it in person, and it shimmers, and the colors are perfect for the place he painted it. Uh, um, I don't know. It's kind of a... Oh, what did Kant call God? Uh, God was like a regulative ideal. <laughs> it's an ideal that you want to get closer and closer to. And... Uh, realize it you're probably not going to get there but it's good enough that it's worth the effort I, I agree and i mean i just read it for the nth time i have no idea how many times i've read it uh, but but i did realize like well oh, my recollection of this was very specific and i had to go dig through my various iliads and find it and i was like oh my recollection of this is fitzgerald and um it just pointed out that I'm not reading Homer. You know, it's being handed to me um, by by Fitzgerald and by Fagels and by not Emily Wilson. And I don't know. It's just important to realize that, I think. Well, religious leaders have this problem with the text. You know, the Bible's written in Greek. And maybe Hebrew. Uh, no, it's written in Greek. And you have to learn Greek if you want to read it in the original. Yeah. And even then, it... It, it's a studied Greek. It's not your natural language. Um, you you do what you can. Well, should we get to what the story is about? Well, we should talk about at least what book one is about. I want to yeah. part apart the first line. Go, John. You've been too quiet. Oh no, I I was gonna let that you parse it if that's what you want to do. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm I'm not gonna say I'm good at it. I've got Fagels. Uh, neither will I, right? This is uh, this actually makes me more nervous than talking about Plato. Uh, he, just because uh, it's more unfamiliar for me. It has to be, like uh, you, you, you know, Plato. While Plato is literature, and he's such a good writer, and it's, it's, it's so much fun to read. It's really it's 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 philosophy, and I think it's easier to get our get a grip on. But this is this has more of an aesthetic experience involved here and uh and it's about emotion it's even it's even it's more abstract even than than plato and it, it's it's tough it's very difficult this first line in fagel's rage goddess rage goddess seeing the rage of peleus's son achilles is the goddess supposed to be rageful too is he saying is he telling this goddess to rage as she describes well, this rage? No, I, I don't think so. So the way it works, so Greek is a, an inflected language. <clears throat> it means that the, the meaning of the words comes from the ending of the word. So whether I say manus or manin changes the meaning. So manin is what the word that it starts with. It <clears throat> tells me it's the object of the sentence. And then... So it's main and Aida Thea. Thea is the subject. So goddess sing the rage. It, the Greek word order is rage, sing goddess, but that doesn't make sense in English. So Fagels has to do kind of the thing that he does to get the first word, the first word. There you go. In, in Greek and in Latin poetry, you can change the word order as you like and put the most important word first, which in English you can't do. Not easily. English English words get their meaning from their position in the sentence. Which man is, bites dog, dog bites man. Which is superior. <laughs> Says you. Uh, no, I, no I, that's a question. Which is? Oh, I thought you... <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Which is superior. <clears throat> uh, I don't know. There's benefits to both. In, in, in I, I know a little... I'm no expert in Greek and Latin poetry. There's so many cool things you can do 
with word order in a language like that. Uh, there are other we neat things that you can do in English. In English, you can make anything act like a verb if you put it in the verb position in the <laughs> sentence. Right. Like gifted. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, meter is a lot easier in Latin when you when because you know if it's long short short long short short long short short and you can mm -hmm. move the order around because they're inflected you can put the words where you need them to be to get the thing to groove it's a um, it's m meter in English is much more difficult I think I, not that I write yeah, Greek verse is, well English poetry is much easier to do in like Shakespeare did it, iambic meter. Very hard to do a triple meter in English. I don't even know how I would do dactylic. Um, I can do the opposite of it. Dr. Seuss was a master. All the who's down in Whoville love Christmas a lot. You know, that's a triple meter. Um, the Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold. You know, it, it's you have to use a whole bunch of prepositional phrases to get that anything close to a, a Homeric meter in English. Um, but the iambic, which is the uh, the long, it's the, the short long, or the unstressed stressed, that's kind of the natural meter of ordinary English conversation. Um, I have a little book here yeah, I, that I think people who are interested in this should get. I've tweeted about this. I think I've showed it to you, Carl. I stole this um, from Katusa Public Schools. Of course you did. When I was... Uh, I was not in junior high. I think I was in the fifth grade, maybe sixth grade. But this little book, um, Focused, Fundamentals of Poetry, uh, William Leahy, and you can find the thing on eBay, Kenneth Publishing Company. Um, it's everything you need to know about meter and the elements of poetry. Meter, verse forms, devices of sound, devices of sense, etc. It's everything you need to know, and it's just perfectly organized, and uh, you ought to be able to find one of these things on eBay for, for real cheap. I highly recommend it if you care. Let's see, I think I have well, the... Let's I, talk about it. Let's, we'll get to the story, I promise. Yeah, and I have, a, I have but, another one. Why it, would you, you might, want to speak poetically? It might look like this, too. Yeah. To why hold, speak poetically? Why not just say, Achilles was angry. He was really angry. He was mad, and this anger hurt people. Why, why can't you just <clears throat> do prose? Uh, what do you gain by po poetry? And I'd say you gain, with me quoting Dr. Seuss, that is burned in my brain. I can't forget those few lines of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I think there's that, and I... Or go ahead, Carl, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just thinking of when Scott read the first line that Yes, the first word is rage. The second word is sing. And there's something about music, right? So it does. It, etch, it etches itself in your memory, but it moves you. And so the response to dealing with something like rage is to sing about it, to actually embody it. If it's just prose, I can just keep it as words on a page, or I could be even more passive in my hearing of it. But as soon as I set it to music, which is what Homer's trying to do, it's going to arouse certain emotions. Uh, and perhaps in such a way that even though the words are telling you to focus on rage, the singing brings in something else. Mm -hmm. And that might be the balance Ooh. that it needs. It's, I, you're going to deal with the weight of rage. Yeah, I have, Other a, passions I have a good example. Involved. I have a good example. Imagine taking the music out of Star Wars. It's the worst movie ever. It's just stupid. It's space wizards and laser swords. It, it's, but put in the soundtrack, put in the music, and you suddenly start to think that this is actually about something. The music fills in a lot of the gaps, and Homer would have sung it. It would have been sung. We nobody knows the melody. The, but it would not just have been uttered. It would have been sung to an accompaniment of a lyre, when he depicts. Uh, bards in the poem itself, that's what they do. When we use verse and poetry, we can convey more content than just what the words convey. 
you can put emphasis on these. It becomes an aesthetic experience. It, it, it has, it has the form of the words themselves take on a beauty without regard to their, without regard maybe to even their meaning. Just the fact that it has the meter makes the thing lilt along or drive. So you can add more meaning, you make it more memorable and it may, you can, you can have the actual delivery of the thing convey an emotion to the audience that the content is trying to convey. Um, my, my daughter's, one of my daughter's favorite bands, Opeth, some, you know, heavy metal, you know, they, they sing about, you know, matters of the soul. It's, it's important stuff. And if they did it with a ukulele and in a tiny Tim falsetto voice, it just wouldn't convey the same weight as it does in the rageful calamitous way that they, that they deliver their music. So you can, you can have the delivery match the content that you want to, that you want to, uh, you want to convey to the audience. It makes you more powerful. So if you can speak in simile and metaphor, when you're an orator, you can, and if you can make your, you know, if you're, if you're Jesse Jackson, you can alliterate and have rhythm in the, in the speech. You, you can bring the audience, you can bring more of the audience to what you're saying. Um, it's rhetoric. It makes you more effective. It makes the message more effective. Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, think, I think so. I think there's a hack here too. You know, making this about rage makes this more impactful than if it was a, I don't know, a book, of, you know, book one of the Iliad was about snuggling. I mean, you know, the, the, the fact that it's about rage means that it's over the top. Like what more impactful topic could we have? What, what could possibly be more human? Sing, Sing the snuggle of Achilles and Perseus. What, what could be more human? Like not even love would be. Like I've got cattle and they seem to have some sort of care for each other. I'm not acting like they love each other, but they seem to have some sort of care for each other, but they're never rageful. Like you might have a couple of dogs that seem to have care for each other. Animals seem to do that. But they're not rageful. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So whatever main and it, whatever this mainness is, it leads Achilles to do things that are not in his apparent interest. He's the greatest warrior of the Greeks. He loves fighting, as Agamemnon points out. He wants glory. How do you get this? Well, you get it by fighting in a war. He has everything he should. He has everything he needs, and yet he withdraws. He also obtains glory by sticking it to the man. You know, in his defiance yeah. of Agamemnon, there's glory in that. He's yeah. the only person that can do that. He's the only person that cannot fight. Everybody else is yeah. trapped on the beach hundreds of miles from home. I mean, this is, this is the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan, except it's 10 years of it. They're on the beach, and they're, they're, the, the water's at their back, and the enemy's in front of them. And he says, well, here we are. There is no retreat. We can't move forward unless I help, and I'll do nothing. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Good luck, guys. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe we ought to uh, sketch out this story. So uh, prologues and epics of the few epics that we have. Uh, they tell you pretty much what you need to know, and you already read it, Scott, that the rage, uh, it's the rage that is murderous and doomed. It's, it's, um, it's not Achilles, it's, it's the rage. And, uh, well, anyway, so he, he closes the prologue, he says, the poet says, uh, begin and use one of the two first broken clash, Agamemnon, Lord of Men, and Brilliance, Achilles. So you have your two characters, the son of Atreides, the son of Atreus, which is how it's named in the poem, and divine Achilles. Why are they fighting? And it all started when uh, what, what happened was, as one does when one conquers a city, you take war brides. Uh, 
Agamemnon had taken a girl named Chryseis, the daughter of uh, Chryses, Chryseis, and Achilles had been given, that's an important point too, he had been given, the Achaeans voted prizes, if you will, he had been given the girl Briseis. Uh So everybody's happy. But Chryseis' dad shows up. And he walks along the beach and he comes up and he says, uh, all of you, you know, armored Achaeans, you know, may you have great success, uh, but give my daughter back. Take this ransom, take this, he brings a whole bunch of, of countless, uh, uncounted ransom, I think is what it says, and uh, honor the god, he's a priest of Apollo, he carries, a, it's like a priest walking in with a cross, he carries a, a, a scepter wrapped around with the, the banners of Apollo, and says, honor the god and give my girl back. And Agamemnon says, no. And sends him away very harshly. No, I will not send the girl back. I prefer her to my own wife. Uh, she's uh, she's going to die in my house. She's going to share my bed. I'm not giving her back. And, well, you modern reader are probably thinking, Agamemnon, why don't you just give the girl back? Well, then why doesn't Achilles give his back? Why doesn't Ajax give his back? Why? What are we? Are we are we Achaeans or not? You know, if this is war. You take prizes. Why should anybody give any of it back? Well, and they're all kings. Um, Agamemnon's king of the Achaeans. Um, Achilles is king of the Myrmidons. They're all kings. So th this, this is a matter of sovereignty, too. Not only is it their tradition of, like, piracy, if, if they can't do what, they're, what, they, what they want to do, if Chryses can come in here and say, give me my daughter back, then Agamemnon isn't who he th claims he is or who he thinks he is. It, go it goes to their very being. It's an attack on who they are. <laughs> and to add to that, right, uh, Carl mentioned the modern reader, it's around line 25 where... Right, uh, Christ, he says, honor the God who strikes from worlds away the sons of Zeus, Apollo. And all the ranks of Achaeans cried out their assent, respect the priest, accept the shining ransom. So it's not just that Agamemnon doesn't listen to the priest, he doesn't listen to his soldiers, the very men over whom he rules. Yeah, that's true. But on the other hand, the soldiers aren't losing anything. He's the one that is being asked to give up his stuff. The soldiers are all keeping their their beauty. But they are losing their lives from the plague. Well, that happens next. So, mm. so this is where Apollo sticks his beak in. Apollo is the one that screws everything up. Everything would have been fine for the Achaeans, except that Apollo makes good on Chryses' threat. And uh, so uh, Chryses goes off and says, I've given you, uh, you know, I've roofed your shrines, I've given you sacrifice, pay the Danaeans back your arrows for my tears. And so Apollo comes down like night from Olympus, and uh, Apollo is the god that strikes from far away. Whenever he, Homer says that, he says that of Apollo, and he says that of his sister, Artemis. The both of them have arrows, which means that they kill people from a distance. Apollo kills people with a plague, Artemis uh, slays women in childbirth. Uh, gods are scary. So, anyway, Apollo comes down, and uh, it's it's actually very cool in Greek. And there's onomatopoeia. You can hear the clanging of the of the arrows on his back as he's coming down. It says he came down like night. I love that line. A little Homeric simile. Starts with the mules and the dogs, but then. Uh, it starts with the men. And it says there was a terrible clang. And I'm just, I know it's poetry and it's mythology. And all that. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm just trying to imagine myself there. What was the sound? Imagine you're there and you hear the sound of a god just like taking aim at you. And then see people start dying. I'm, I'm, look, I'm letting the poem affect me aesthetically. I'm trying to get into 
what it's doing. And I'm trying not to be a stupid modern reader and saying, well, actually, there's no such thing as Apollo. This was just the bubonic plague. No, man, it's a god. The god came down from Olympus. That's how you need to read it first. Maybe later you can be skeptical and, and work out you know, what you think actually happened. But first reading, it's a god comes down. Uh, and nine days, uh, nine days, he cut them down in droves, and the corpse fires burned on night and day, no end in, in sight. Nine days of people dying. What are you going to do? Agamemnon hasn't done anything. Achilles steps up and says, well, it looks like we're going to lose. I guess we should go home. Unless, unless there's a prophet. Maybe somebody can interpret dreams and tell us what's going on. Uh, and of course, there is a prophet. And we find out that Apollo is not mad because we screwed up a sacrifice. Apollo is angry because Agamemnon didn't give the girl back. And uh, you think, well, this is simple. I, Yeah, you, this is simple. Agamemnon, just give the girl back and we can get back to killing Trojans. It's not so simple. It's not so simple. Why can't he give the girl back? He's, he doesn't want to. And if he does, it causes huge problems. Uh, he says, this is a line, well, it, in Fagels, it's line 130. Uh, the archer multiplies our pains because I, I refuse that glittering price for the young girl, Chryseis. Indeed, I prefer her by far, the girl herself. I want her mine in my own house. I rank her higher than Clytemnestra, my wedded wife. That's some foreshadowing there. You know the story of Agamemnon. Uh, she's nothing less in build or breeding in mind or works of hand, but I'm willing to give her back even so if that is what is best for all. Really want to keep my people safe, not see them dying. You can take him at his word. He, after all, he does give the girl back. But here's the important point. But fetch me another prize and straight off to else I alone of the Argives go without my honor. That would be a disgrace. You are all witness. Look, my prize is snatched away. So something's going on more than you have to give the girl back. Do you think he can't be a king without honor? I think he can't be a king without honor. Yeah. Yeah, and honor, I think, is measurable. Yeah, there's a line. Uh, I 
Achilles says uh, of him, oh, I don't know where the line is, uh, that Agamemnon boasts to be the greatest of the Achaeans. Uh, you would follow the one who is the best. How do you know who is the best? What does it mean? So aristocracy is the rule by the best. Well, uh, as uh, Socrates might say, could you define that for me? Should we stop saying meritocracy and start saying aristocracy? I mean, if aristocracy is ruled by the best. Well, that's what the word means. It should be the rule by the aristocracy, by the, by the best uh, superlative of callous, meaning fine and, and uh, I think it is, at least. Or maybe it's the superlative of agathos. Uh, uh, er, yeah, Ariston is the superlative of agathos. So, we, it would be best to be led by the best, wouldn't it? But, who are the best? How do we identify who the best are? You know, I, not to bring it to modern things, but I remember somebody saying, uh, I, I don't hate elites, I hate our art elites. <laughs> you know, that, that uh, uh, it's uh, the idea that the, the people who claim to be the best of us are really the best of us seems offensive. Well, what do I mean by the best? What does Agamemnon mean by the best? He's got, so why would he need a new prize? How does he think of bestness. Well, I don't even think we have to go that far. He got Croesus because as a war spoil. The the effects of the war, the the effects of the battle are being undone here. Like the defeated, her father is getting is going to be able to claw back his property. What was the war what was the battle for? You know, if I go and fight and we take these risks and people die and I kill and then when it's all over, you still lose the territory? You still lose the, I mean, what was it all for? Um, it's, it's actually an enormous injustice. You know, um, um, imagine the, the storming the beaches of Normandy getting through maybe up to like June 10th of 44 and then have to get back on the boat and go back to England. Like what? And it's not because you lost. So this is where it, it's darn it. It's Apollo who messes with everything. You know, you have uh, might makes right. The stronger make the laws. This is the way that the book is working, except that Apollo puts his thumb on the scale for his priest. And screws up the division <clears throat> and the spoils. And leads to this question, well, Achilles has a claim to be the best too, doesn't he? And if Apollo hadn't done anything, we would not get this, uh, I think, it, a, a marvelous drama and thoughts about who is actually the best of the Achaeans. What does it mean to be the best? Agamemnon has the most money. He has the most men following him. If you read the, the catalog of ships, the next chapter, um, he has by far the most. So I guess he's the best because he has the most. Well, Achilles attacks him a little bit at, in 142 when he calls him uh, most grasping. Yeah, uh, just how Agamemnon, great field marshal, most grasping man alive? How can the generous Argives give you prizes now? I know of no troves of treasure piled, lying idle anywhere. Whatever we've dragged from towns, we plundered, all's been portioned out. You know, most grasping man alive. You know, so is he, he may not be, he may not be most honored, but he might be most grasping. So, so you could have the most ships, you could have the most treasure, and, and later on in book one, uh, uh, Achilles pokes at him because he typically doesn't fling himself into the middle of battle. 
he do, he doesn't always act in the most honorable way. Agamemnon. So as you were talking, Scott, and I, I've been I've been digging more into the Greek as you all were going through this. So there's there's a fun wordplay that's happening. Uh, in those last three lines from Agamemnon around line 140, right? Uh, the archives go without my honor. Uh, that's agerastos in Greek. That would be a disgrace. You are all uh, my witness. Look, my honor, geras, is snatched away. So it's actually the same term. Fagels is hmm. kind of playing with prize the second time, but it's the same word, right? So I then... The statement about most grasping man of life, it is uh, love of acquisition. That's the Greek for it. Which then raises a question about, well, what makes a king? Because, Carl, you were talking about, and both of you were talking about, if I right, if I, uh, if I win the, the battle and I keep the spoils, well, is it just the bare act of acquisition that makes me right. king? And is honor, therefore... At root about acquisition but what achilles says or at least the way he puts it is acquisition is not enough to make you king in fact it's a reproachable thing uh, but yeah just seeing that wordplay there that my honor is something i acquire that seems to be implied and the reproach from achilles perhaps this is where his rage really is is you've acquired something you don't deserve but then that throws us back to the question well what makes anybody merit anything or worthy of anything yeah yeah I, I mean what if Agamemnon were like I don't know uh, uh, what if he was what if he was just physically repugnant what do you mean you know kind of sweaty like uh, a worm tongue yeah uh, I was thinking more like Jabba the hut I have Star Wars in my brain uh but he's just, he's not, and, and yet you're supposed to think he's the greatest of you. Why? Because he's got more stuff. There's something offensive to that. And this is, a, and I mentioned Nomos and Fusus before, and I've got, you know, Mr. Alamario on my brain here, that Agamemnon is the greatest by the laws, by having the money, by having all of this stuff. Is he the greatest by nature at fighting. So, or who's greater, the, the zookeeper or the lion? Hmm. I like that the better than your. Owns the lion. I like that better than your Jabba Hut illusions. <laughs> I'm trying here. I'm throwing things out. Uh, it, uh, Agamemnon is facing. A crisis of leadership here. He has a belief that he has to have a certain kind of esteem or honor or glory uh, perceived of around him in order to be the king. Um, but apparently there is some question as to his true merit. Uh, later on, we'll find... Um, We'll find uh, uh, around, I don't know, about 210, the questions of like, you know, how good of a soldier he is are raised. This, this kind of combat is mostly hand to hand. This is, this is, uh, this isn't hoplite stuff. There's no, what, testudo. There's no, th th this is not uh, high tactic and strategy here. Um, you know, Achilles actually goes out and hacks people to pieces with swords, and there isn't there isn't talk about pincher movements and turning the flank here. So, you know, Napoleon can be a great soldier without being a wonderful marksman or great with the lance or the sword. In this arena, you can't. You actually have to go do the thing, and it's not clear that Agamemnon does his. His raw bravery, I believe, is always at que in question. It's not that he's a coward, but he's certainly not the kind of soul, the brave man that Achilles is, that Hector is, that Ajax is, that Diomedes is. And I think Agamemnon's aware of that. Yeah. Let me give a, a, a parallel. In defense of Agamemnon, he's of the one that got everybody will. together. 
because it's my job. He's the one that got everybody together. He is, imagine, uh, speaking of uh, Normandy, Eisenhower never showed up on the battlefield. He was a paper pusher. He arranged everything. Uh, so what you're saying is Eisenhower was a clerk? Yeah. He was. But is he not great? You know, I mean, you've got here some tension here, the boundary between the age of heroes and the age of, you know, corporate power. Kings leading armies from behind. The heroes, uh, they're great stories, and the individual valor is what matters, and Achilles has as much of that as anybody did. Yeah. But... It you is, know, it's, is this the tension it's between uh, Georgie Patton and Ike? Sure. You could read it that way. Yeah, it, it's the times are changing, and you can see them changing in the book. And Achilles is the old style, and mm -hmm. Agamemnon is the new. You know, in the future... You will, I mean, Napoleon, how many people did Napoleon kill? Not battle? enough. <laughs> Won 27 battles, which is amazing for a general. More than anybody else. But, you know, was he in the front lines? Not much. So was he not great? Because he was, you know, there was probably some French Legion of Honor person who was a better personal soldier than Napoleon. Should he have been the one that was the emperor? Shouldn't it go to the greatest individual? Well, how do you measure greatest? Yeah, what's great? The one who's able to push papers better and arrange artillery better, or the one who's able to fight on the field better? That's interesting that you say that, that Achilles is the, the old-style soldier. Maybe that's right. I hadn't thought of that before. But they're, they're all, they are all here because Menelaus, Agamemnon's little brother— got cut his wife was either either slipped away or snuck away or was stolen it's not exactly clear what happened but helen the face that that launched a thousand ships is now inside the walls of troy however she got there she was menelaus's wife he's outraged he wants her back he calls his brother and his brother is agamemnon the king of all the kings at this point and he does organize the thing. He, he, he blows the horn and the Myrmidons and the Danaeans and, and everyone shows up and they storm the beaches and here they are in the, the black beaked ships. Um, yeah, maybe he is the Eisenhower of this. He caused it to happen. Otherwise it would have been a, this rowboat and that rowboat show up and they get snuffed out on the beach. Because the, the Trojans have their great warriors as well. It's it's not a slam dunk. They've been locked. They've been locked up in a deadlock for ten years already. Yeah, maybe he is the Eisenhower of this. Yeah, but it's it's hard. You know, you don't make movies about Eisenhower. Maybe they're you're going to show him nobly sitting at a table with his pedestal. And then he scratched a few more numbers on a on a sheet of paper and sent a dispatch. Woo! <laughs> That's why you make an AMC series about him. Hmm. Is there one? I don't, I don't have cable no. anymore, John. Do they have Eisenhower Week like they used to have Hitler Week on History Channel? Shark Week, Eisenhower <laughs> Week. It, it's just harder to make good television because our... To me, our, our nature is to respond to the great nature in the other. You know, to see Achilles do incredible things and say, wow. You know, um, they got some things right in that Troy movie with, um, Pitt. what's his name, Brad Pitt. Uh, where he's just better than everybody. In the beginning of the movie where he fights the giant and, and just jumps up and chops him in the neck and he's dead you know it's so fast it's uh that that leads to more admiration it's hard to get inspired by 
it's hard to get inspired by your CFO. <laughs> that makes sense. It does make sense. The plague has been upon them for nine weeks, nine days, not nine nice. weeks, nine days. Um, Calcus, I think, is the one, the seer. He, he, he figures out, he, he can see, he knows that Apollo is angry because his priest was offended. And that's what this is about. So it's determined. I mean, he's got a, he's got a potential mutiny on his hands, Agamemnon does. When, when the seer says, uh, Agamemnon's made Apollo mad, that's why this is happening. These guys are dying. You talk about an inglorious death. You just got scabs and buboes, and you just die of the Black Plague, you know, because you've got mouse lice on you. That's not what they're there to do. So he has he has a, a, a potential mutiny, and people are starting to push back on him. And finally, Agamemnon, oh, around 160, he says, "All right, you know, I'll put the girl on a boat." But you guys need to you guys need to give me something, and he he says I'll I will take a prize for myself your own he's talking to Achilles or Ajax's or Odysseus's prize I'll com- commandeer her myself and let that man I go to visit uh, choke with rage so now he's threatening them I'm going to go and take your stuff but you know what he doesn't he sends an envoy to Achilles to take Briseis. He doesn't go. You're right. He doesn't do it. He does. He goes corporate. He right. sends a memo. He's like, okay, I'll put my I'll put my girl on the boat. I'll give clever Odysseus the reins, the the helm on the boat. He can take him back, and then I'm going to go and I'm going to go kick your butt and I'm going to go take your things. But then he doesn't do it. He sends an envoy, and Achilles, Achilles is gracious. He says to him, you know, I, this is no affair of yours. I, you're doing this on orders. I don't hold you responsible. And he asked the guy to have a seat next to him. And he's gracious to the envoy. Agamemnon is a terrible, yeah. terrible leader, I believe. I'm, I'm looking for the name of the envoy. I can't find it. Oh, there's some E names. Yeah. Or something. Uh, I, I, uh, well, whenever somebody seems to be super terrible to me, I think, well, how is he not terrible? <laughs> I got to figure out how he's not terrible. Uh, you know, why does Agamemnon think this is the only path he can take? And his his power is based on his having the most. And if he has less, then um, you know, might as well let Achilles be the chief. But, but how but, do we measure who is the best? Achilles is actually the chief. <sighs> but to to to, uh, to Achilles demerit, he won't seize the power that he really actually has. Like we could we could have eased, this this whole story could completely be different in a moment if he just slapped Agamemnon's jowls and said, listen, you're through. You brought a plague on us. You're not the finest fighter among us. You prevaricate. You've caused all these problems. We can't win. You are in our way. Give that girl back. Get on the boat. You go home. I'm going to take us to victory. But he doesn't right, do it. So there's some, he doesn't do it. So there's some parallels here. So, uh, Oh gosh, there's so much to talk about. Dear listener, there's so much to talk about. Why does Achilles um, not seize this opportunity? At any moment, he could kill Agamemnon, well, uh, uh, humiliate and to. ultimately dishonor him, and he doesn't do that. Okay. All right, there's some parallels here. Apollo takes the girl, Agamemnon takes the girl. So Agamemnon acts like Apollo, um, acts godly in his own right. Uh, Achilles is ready to kill him and does not do it. So what happens is Achilles has promised Agamemnon. He says, look, we can't get you another prize, but after we win the war, we'll get you another prize. Right. We will gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. 
Agamemnon can't do this. Achilles later says Agamemnon doesn't know that he needs to think about what's forward and what's backwards. Agamemnon doesn't want to think of the future or the past. Um, so he doesn't want gifts on credit. Well, Athena says, line 248 in Fagel's, uh, don't lay hand to the sword, lash him with threats of the price he will face. And I tell you this, and I know it is the truth. One day, glittering gifts will lie before you three times over to pay for all his outrage. Achilles is able to take a payment in future. Agamemnon is not. So maybe he should be the leader, but Athena says, don't be. So once again, you have a god putting her finger on the scale and screwing with the natural order of things. The natural order of things is Agamemnon and Achilles fight. One of them wins. Army gets on with its life. Um, the gods are screwing with them. Why are they screwing with them? At 211, Agamemnon says, So you're a great soldier, but that's just a gift of God. Yeah. Like, so who does Agamemnon think he... I mean, this is a cliche. Who does he think he is? Like, like literally, like, how does he see himself in the order? Because, you know, things do hap just, cause, just happen because of gods, like plagues, or Athena calls Achilles to, to stand down, or... Gods just make you a great soldier. Well, what does Agamemnon think he is? Well, he's a well, he's only a king because of Zeus. Um, yeah, I think that's a terrible insult. That's like for me, that's a you say to some great athlete. Well, you're just really talented. You're just tall. Yeah, God made you seven feet tall. That's why you're good. It's nothing that you did. You know, it's kind of an insult. Um, there's so much going on here. Earlier, Achilles' complaints against Agamemnon are, I think, reasonable. He says, you know, uh, we all followed you to please you, to fight for you, to win your honor back from the Trojans. Menelaus and you, you dog face. If you look it up, he really does call him that. Uh, you know, any soldier in any war could say, you know, hey, Napoleon, <laughs> the Egyptians never did me any harm. Why am I here in Cairo? You know, why am I doing this? The, the corporate king complex uh, <laughs> tells you to do something that's not necessarily directly in or against your interest. Uh, you know, here you are in Vietnam. You know, what did the Vietnamese ever do to you? Yes, but this conflict isn't between uh, McNamara in a marine private, this is this is Patton and Montgomery, or Montgomery and Eisenhower, or something like that. You know, th this is the leadership having a conflict. It's um, it's the worst thing that could happen, probably, other than defeat. All right, I want to I want to do something. I was looking at this. Uh... So good. Well, let, or so. let me let me finish that. The private soldier is sure. always going to have this complaint that the leaders aren't doing this. It's on my back. Like there's a guy that rows one of these trireme ships who, <laughs> I mean, he's a goat herd and he gets swept up into this and he's, a, and he's at the oars. He's going to have all of these complaints and the private soldier has always had those complaints. But the fact that this is, you know, field grade or staff grade, you know, people that are having these fights is yeah. is significant. Yeah, and you're right. And it's I think in the next book, um, either book two or three, one of the privates, name of Thersites, makes the same sort of complaints about Agamemnon that Achilles does. <clears throat> and uh, he is not listened to. Odysseus clubs him on the head and makes him cry. And everybody laughs and he shuts up. You know, in, in World War II, uh, MacArthur got called Dugout Doug. You know, uh, in the Civil War, we have the King of Spades. You know, the, the private soldier who is at greater risk, you know, since the time began, 
has got complaints about, about, about the boss, but this is different. That's not a noble fight. You know, when a, the guy that carries the mortar base plate is mad at Norman Schwarzkopf, that's understandable. But when, when these, when guys at this level have this conflict, now it's interesting. John, you're not saying right, anything. I well, I was, again, digging around in, in the Greek just to, I mean, to heighten the tension of all of this. The first time the Greek word that we know it is good from Plato and Aristotle, agathos, uh, this shows up around line 153 of the Thagel's translation. It is actually Agamemnon describing Achilles as good right, or noble. And I, I wondered to, to add to the the drama of ruling, uh, it is that. I think Agamemnon knows he is not the better man. And he is not a good man. Uh, but I, I, I'm going to be careful with how I use good here because I think it's much more open, especially in a work like this. That sense of good does not mean all morally pure or right uh, contemplating the good like you would see in Plato. So it's kind of a more, a more striking thing. And to go back to what Carl was saying about about the gods and their involvement in all of this, if they're putting their thumbs on the scale, uh, and I think Achilles senses this, right? I think he says to uh, Athena, why are you coming down now just to see me suffer? Uh, it also raises this question about whether the gods value goodness uh, in the strongest sense, or do they value something else? But that's why I've been a little quiet. It's just I've been digging in and noticing that's the first time the word for good ever appears in the Western canon is to describe hmm. Achilles from Agamemnon. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, let's do a bit more Greek. Uh, so I want to talk about this scepter. Hmm. This scepter. So the, the scepter is this big club, Sceptron. And uh, Achilles talks about it in Fagels. It's line 270. To, I tell you this, and I swear a mighty oath upon it by this this scepter. Look, that never again will put forth crown and branches. And in the Greek, it's upote puse pua. Got the word pusis in there, or the verb form of pusis. I have been thinking about nature and everything else. The scepter, which is a symbol of Agamemnon's kingship, it was given to the house of Atreus. But what is it? It's a stump. Okay, the symbol of the kingship, of the corporate kingship. This is me interpreting. Uh, the scepter looked that never again will put forth crown and branches. Now it's left its stump on the mountain ridge forever, nor will it sprout new green again. Now the brazen axe has stripped its bark and leaves, and now the sons of Achaea pass it back and forth as they hand their judgments down, upholding the honored customs of never cease commands. This scepter, this scepter will be a mighty force behind my oath. So he's swearing on this dead thing. It's studded with golden nails. It's really pretty, but it's not a tree anymore. It does not give life. Um, Achilles. Achilles, you know, the gods made him a spearman. He's he's good by his personal abilities. He's not a he's not a stump. Yeah. Does this make any sense? Yeah, because and, and he says in this One passage, day a for Achilles will strike Achaea's sons, and you'll all know that you need me, and, and then you'll you'll be mad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're 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 right about that because he this the, this 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 stick, this dead thing, was given to his, his house, his family by Zeus, and th that's how he rules. He's like, look, I got the stick. It's not through his own merit. It's not because he's well, a great. Softly, carry the big stick. Yeah, it, it's a, you know, and, and one of the one of the thing the one of the rough things about reading the canon like this, is we're just dropped in the middle of this conflict on the beach. They've already been here ten years. Later on, later on, we'll read, um, oh my gosh, in Aeschylus about Agamemnon, and you find out that his house is cursed. 
that his his ancestors had eaten some <laughs> some some kids and or fed they they how, how did it work uh uh he got in, they got in a feud with uh, a neighboring king and uh killed one of their children and and cooked them up and served them to the the neighboring king um and said ha ha you just ate your kid you know and and then the, there's a big curse that comes down on the house of atreides and it goes on and on. And Agamemnon, he comes home after this war, and Clytemnestra and her lover kill him. And it just goes on and on. I mean, he, Agamemnon is cursed. We don't get that. We don't get that part of the story when we're just dropped in here on the beach after the tenth year of the the war against Troy. But we're trying to parse out who Agamemnon is, and the audience that was listening to this would already know that the whole house of Atreides was poisoned. I, I have a question. What do you guys think of this practice and the epic of starting in the middle of things? Um, it wouldn't have been that way for normal people then. There was no middle. They already knew. Yeah, I suppose. They would have known the outline in general. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I, I like the idea of being thrown into it. <clears throat> I feel like I'm channeling my latent Heidegger uh, being thrown into something. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it puts you in the situation where, especially because it's rage that it throws you into from the start. I, I think there's something true to that. Right? In the moment, you can't work back to the beginning to figure out why this passion has become something that drives you so intensely. I think that's part of bringing the readers in, or listeners in, right? It should be clear. Right? Uh, it's adding to the rhythm and the cadence of the words and the telling of it that if you start in the middle of the action, you can't help but be drawn into experience and feel what the passions of the moment are, rather than keeping that narrative distance of, yeah. after all this time, this is why Achilles got rageful. Yeah, I like that. I like that you you just meet these people and you don't know them yet. Yeah, you, the the straight A student would say would go on Wikipedia and find out all the names of the Greek gods and their relationships and the backstory on everybody. Well, you you've already spoiled it because you, you know Agamemnon before you even get to the book. I would rather. I like the effect of it, where. The Rage of Achilles, son of Peleus. Well, who is that? And maybe you find out later there's more backstory. You know, I, my second favorite book of all time is The Lord of the Rings, and he will do this to you. You just meet people, and you have no idea they've got 50,000 years of history in other books, and the author doesn't tell you. And, uh, you find it out later. But, you know, your experience, I mean, when you meet people in real life, you don't know their story. You always meet people in the middle of things. You get them at this moment of time, and then you work backwards and forwards and figure out, well, you know, he got cigarettes put out on him when he was a kid, and, uh, well, this explains some things. You know, you didn't know that before. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I kind of like it. <laughs> That's also how you meet people's characters. Because right? when you meet somebody, you never know how their character was formed. But you get a pretty good sense of who Agamemnon and Achilles are very quickly by being introduced to them. Right? These, or you think of someone like Plutarch, who says, I use the little instances to show you a life. This is a little instance in the grand scope of things, but it tells you a lot about them. Scott, I think you wanted to jump in. Sorry. No, no apology necessary. That's how we get it. That's how we get this book. That's how it's given to us. And I think I think it works as a piece of art. And I think the things that you guys say are true. But I still have to double down on it. wouldn't have been that way for the Greek listener. They they knew they knew the story of Tantalus. Tantalus cut up his son and fed him to the gods. And the gods got mad at him. They revived the son and made him wonder, made him beautiful, and like gave him gifts. 
uh, and then they took Tantalus and made him stand in a swamp. And he, and there was a there were fruit hanging over him, and every time he reached for the fruit, the wind would blow it out of his reach. He couldn't reach it, and when he was thirsty, he would bend over to drink, and the water would recede. This is where we get the word tantalize, right from Tantalus, and through, then his son Pelops has a kid, um, starts the D. I can't remember, and then it's Atreus, who is Agamemnon's granddad, I think. So because of Tantalus's actions. This guy, Agamemnon, is cursed. He can't, he can't do right because of his birth. He is incapable of being charmed. Not, but not like by somebody's wiles, but having a charmed life. He is incapable of, of good because of his birth. And everybody would have known that who was listening to this. It's almost like if you had gone to Sunday school from the time you were pre-literate, before you could read, before you had memory, and you just know the stories of the Bible, the, the listener to whichever bard would be recounting the story to would already know all this. It wouldn't have as much suspense in it for them. Kind of, yeah, kind of, yeah, it kind of sucks I, I for them. I it, still like him in Midlothians. Well, I do too, and I, and I think maybe it has more artistic value b- because you're dropped in the middle of this cliff. It it makes a cliffhanger out of the thing, but it wouldn't have been that way for them. Yeah, I, it, it it would be well, it would be transmitting that, culture for them, right? Like this is just like telling them. It, this is telling the Greek who they are, and this is ancient history for them already. You know, if you're in Athens hearing this, it's 400 years, 500 years. I don't, nobody really even actually knows. It's hundreds of years before Socrates. Yeah, it's about as far away from them as uh, Columbus is from us. Yeah. If there's any actual history to the deeds. Uh, so these are tales of people from a long, long time ago. Uh, there have been invasions. They've had a dark age in between. Uh, these are ancient heroes. Uh, probably I ought to talk a bit about Achilles and Agamemnon is cursed. Well, kind of so is Achilles. Achilles is. Um, so Achilles is the son of a goddess. The goddess is Thetis, and Thetis is an unhappy case. Uh, there is a prophecy... You know, you can get this. You read all these stories, you get it. Uh, if you don't want spoilers, you know, skip ahead a few minutes or, or wait until I'm done talking. Um, Thetis is a goddess for whom it is prophesied that her son will be greater than his father, speaking of nature. Uh, so she is prime breeding material. Whatever, whatever she gets hooked up with is going to be greater than his father. And both Poseidon and Zeus are interested but cannot be allowed to marry her, to breed with her. Cannot be allowed to, because it would be the end of the dynasty. If When you read Prometheus, um, Prometheus bound, Aeschylus is clear on this. This is Prometheus' ace in the hole. He knows that he knows what will be the downfall of Zeus. It will be if Thetis marries him, or has children by him. You know, who knows? Marriage. Uh, Thetis, and, uh, Thetis so is... She is She's Poseidon's daughter. No, no. She's the daughter of the old man of the sea, which is not Poseidon. Somebody else. Some other god. God. Nellius? I don't know. I can't remember his name. Uh, I'm going to that up. Yeah, uh, Pindar talks about it a bit. Zeus and Poseidon both wanted her. The son would be greater than the father. Uh, So Achilles is a compromise. So they... They find this hero, Peleus, and they say, we're going to marry you to Thetis. And uh, um, it, so she has to marry a mortal, and her child is greater than Peleus, who is a great hero in his own right, uh, but not immortal. Nereus is her father. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Yeah. Uh, and so 
he could have been a god, he should have been a god, he should have been a god greater than Zeus. Except that they couldn't stand this, and so they forestalled the great genetic destiny of Hestes. But the great genetic destiny of Achilles was forestalled by having her married to Peleus. A mortal. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's got divine aspirations, I would say, and um, mortal limitations. He's going to die. He cannot be immortal. His mom is immortal. Can you imagine that? Your mom's going to live forever, but you're not. Uh, and so, you know, what kind of immortality can he get? except through being the greatest of the Achaeans. Yeah, he, he, Just the, he he's told that yeah. he can achieve immortality through deeds or he can go farm. That's the that's the prophecy yeah. that's laid before him. Yeah. But, yeah, so so, he, so so when Agamemnon, uh, so Agamemnon takes his girl, and when he says, I'm not going to fight, this is very momentous. This is, uh, when Achilles is dishonored, it's like you're sealing his immortality. You're taking his afterlife, which for them was your reputation well and they're yeah, right I, i've heard i've said this before i think and i mean the, the, i think the old jesuit casuists used to say that that um, slander was not a sin against a bearing false witness it's a sin against the fifth commandment thou shalt not kill hmm. because to to take away someone's reputation is like killing them <laughs> it's more of a, an ancient view of honor you know you take somebody who's great and you, you take away their greatness uh that's a big deal poor guy uh so this is not just anger it's not the anger of achilles it's maybe the mania of achilles i don't know there's no great english word for this the obsession of achilles I can see John thinking. He's going through Greek, his Greek lexicon in his head. It's like the Terminator. He's pulling up words. But yeah, uh, obsession doesn't, it would not seem to capture it. Um, but it's always well, hard to from one language to the next. Yeah, yeah you're right. I, I'm I think, not going to. I think you're right. That, I mean, you just have to transliterate it. You have to go with mania. And then, like you're doing just now, using the story to figure out what it means. In this case, it is the laws of his honor and his life. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's a real big deal. How do you measure greatness? Uh, and like that, I don't know who said that, but the thing about I'm, I'm not against elites, I'm against our elites. You know, I'm, I'm offended that those that are considered elites are considered to be the best, that they can't be the best. Can they? Is it possible that Agamemnon, Agamemnon is the best of the Achaeans? He has the highest net worth. He has the most soldiers. I guess he's the best. He's the organizer of the army. Well, and yet, and yet, I think it is possible that somebody in his position could be the best. But that's part of the story here: is the fact that he's not, and that tension that you know one of his captains is actually the best and holds the thing in his hand. That's that's the whole story. And McClellan was the best of the union. Probably. But yeah. But it didn't work. Um Achilles he has this this rage, this anger, because uh, he's a man of destiny and his destiny is being interfered with. And you know, his destiny is this immortality through his deeds. He already knows this. And I am interested 
in the idea that th- that that Homer knew this. Like I can kind of we can look at 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 deeds and see people's immortality. Like there was just a movie about a, t- a bad movie apparently about Napoleon that was released. No, Napoleon has reached an immortality through his deeds. Um, we we talked to Eisenhower, the, the Patton. McClellan, and Homer is on the cusp, on the edge of history. Like before him, it's arguably prehistoric. You know, um, there were great, there were great warriors, um, whose only only weapon was a stick and a a thrown rock, but we'll never know who they were, and. You know, only with the written word, really, can you get this sort of immortality through deeds. And it's interesting to me that Homer writes about that because it couldn't have existed very, very much longer or very very much earlier than him. Yeah, so you can't have heroes without poets. Might be. Go together. You're just a guy with a big stick. Unless there's somebody to sing about you and, and the big stick. Or at, le- or at least to tell the story. I don't know if it has to necessarily be, you know, a song. But some somebody must tell the story. Yeah. This, this might be more rambling than I intended to, so you can stop me. I'm, I'm thinking, Carl, right, you, you could just be the guy with the big stick and then going back to that wordplay that I never picked up on about the the growing of the crown and branches. Achilles seems to know the stick is just a stick. Which is a really striking thing for a hero. And then if I really want to push further into what the text is actually saying and what Homer is actually trying to convey, in this poem, a place where you would not expect it to be, you have a human being who has a claim to ruling over others admitting that there is something unnatural about it all, right? That you have to denature something and take it out of nature to rule. Um, and that, so I want to bring that back into the drama. Well, what is Achilles' nature then? Especially because he has goddess in him. He has the divine, yet he's human and doomed. Is there any way for him to rule? And then to, to go back to the poet who's singing about these men, why is this the man that Homer feels compelled to sing about, to elevate? And I know the Odyssey is on the horizon, but for now, this is the first one that we have. A yeah, why, story Achilles, of. why tell his story? Uh, you know what? Or why would the audience want to hear about Achilles? Uh, that's a. It would be speculation, but it might be fruitful speculation. You know, who was Homer? Who was he writing for? Uh, I don't know, writing for Ionian Greeks. Uh, Lattimore has some good thoughts on that. that um, Ionian Greeks who had maybe fled the Dorian invasion, you know, these were their heroes. Um, Long lost heroes. But even then, you know, it's, let's say it's 800 BC, 700 BC. Well, there's starting to be polices around. Again, they're starting to be cities. These are corporate entities. Um, you're gonna have, a, gosh, you're gonna have a mayor and an assembly, and uh, ick, you know, like uh, uh, my 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 kid is uh, is at a at a very fine school. He he has instituted a student council, and he always wants to talk about. It. He's very excited about it, and I try not to crush his dreams because he's very excited about it. But I just I, ick. I don't want to do any of that. You know, I want adventure. I want pirates. I want uh, individual greatness is thrilling. Corporate meetings is not. Um, and I, okay, so there's something else. Uh, when Achilles is sitting down. Um, 
I'm not sure exactly where it is. There's a spot where Achilles is just not doing anything. Uh, he's not doing anything. It says he is also not going to the assembly and um, he's not going to the assembly. The, the assembly that gives glory to men is what the, the Greek says. I can't remember the line. I'm sorry. I'm unprepared. I haven't done my homework. But I was thinking about that. You know, what good is the assembly? See, it's why do you want to talk in meetings? Well, for some people, it's a way to glory. For some people, it's the way that they can get the glory that they could get, they can't get because they're no good at fighting. Uh, Carl, I'm going to have to track down that line because I was just looking at... Yeah, if you can give me a, a few minutes, I can find it. Okay, because and once you find it, I'll, I'll double check to confirm, but it's around line 327 in Fagel's. Uh, this is where Nestor's speaking. Um, and he just says, A sceptered king to whom, Ze uh, whom great Zeus gives glory. Referring to Agamemnon, uh, on Greek fact for all those of you out there, the word for glory in that instance is kudos. So anytime you give kudos to somebody, you're speaking Greek. Yeah, and kudos is, is singular, not plural. Uh, yeah, so I found it. it in Fagel's, it's page 94, line 583 or so. He raged on, grimly camped by the fast feet, the royal son of Peleus, the swift runner Achilles, and now he no longer haunted the meeting grounds, that's the Agora, where men win glory. There is the Agorain Kudia Neron. And it's where you get your kudos. It's in the, in the assembly, which he doesn't want to go to anymore. That's not for him. Agamemnon can bluster his way through the assembly and gain glory, but that's no place for a warrior. Uh, yep. At, at 342, uh, Achilles tells him, Agamemnon, what a worthless burnout coward I'd be called if I would submit to you and all your orders. He, he doesn't he doesn't care about his orders. He doesn't care about his rules. Achilles is there for his own purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Human resources meetings where you gain glory. Yeah. Patton, Patton wasn't yeah. there to do what Omar Bradley or, or Ike told him to do. He was there he to was kill there the other fool, other guy. That's what he was there for. I guess Patton was right. He probably was reincarnated, wasn't he? Achilles, I knew him. Uh, okay, so I want to point out, we got a little time. There's, there's so much good stuff in this. This is just one book out of 24. Um, it's line 400 and something where Achilles talks about how Agamemnon can't see past and future. He lacks the sense to see a day behind, a day ahead, and safeguard the Achaeans battling by their ships. So Agamemnon is, is defending his honor, but he's only thinking of it at this point in time. At this point in time, my honor goes lower because I have to give up my girl, and I'm going to take the other one so that my honor goes back up at this point in time. He can't take a promise from Achilles of more glory later, and he can't think to the future and say, what will things be like if Achilles goes home? He's not far seeing. Um, and John, you said something about Achilles you know, knowing that it's just a stick. Uh, Achilles is my favorite character in the book, and I know he's violent and murderous, and but no more than anybody else is in the story. But he, at some points, seems to know, he seems to be able to step out and see the game for what it is. He seems to have a little critical distance on ancient Greek heroes. When he complains that, you know, Zeus sends, um, Zeus has two jars and he sends out of them, he pulls out good things for us and bad things for us. He himself never suffers. Yeah, Achilles knows what's going on. 
Is he smarter? Is Sometimes. he is he not just the best soldier, the best killer? Uh gosh, I think so. Except he's not he's not disposed to management. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I I I love he is a great leader, even though he doesn't want that job. I I, I love that. I already mentioned it once. I love it at 392, 3, something like that, where Achilles says, Welcome, couriers, good heralds of Zeus and men. Here, come closer. You've done nothing to me. You're not to blame. No one but Agamemnon. He's the one who sent you for Briseis. Go, Patroclus, prince. Bring out the girl and hand her to them so they can take her back. But let them both bear witness to my loss in the face. Yeah. He doesn't, you know, Agamemnon, I can imagine him shooting the messenger kicking a dog and uh, Achilles Achilles is not going to do that he knows who his foe is and though he's rageful he doesn't pour it out on these messengers these couriers he's not just the best soldier he's he, he is he seems to be great You know, does Agamemnon mourn all the dead? Does he mourn one of the dead? No, it took nine days and nobody stood up to speak for the dying soldiers, but swift-footed Achilles. Does it, it, no one in this, well, I think there are three people in the Iliad that grieve. Achilles, Priam, and Andromache. There's, There's one, one more. more. Patroclus. Patroclus grieves? When he, yeah, when he grieves over all of the... Uh, he comes in, Achilles, you're like a rock, you're a stone. Mm, that's true. He's got tears running down his face. Yeah, that's true. All the Achaeans getting killed. Yeah, Patroclus is his cousin, I think. I think that's right, Achilles' cousin. Um, Ajax is a cousin. Um, Achilles is uh, Peleus' son. Uh, Peleus' brother is Telamon. Ajax is Telamonian Ajax. And then Toyser is another cousin who's also, I think he's also Telamon's son by a different woman. Um, Toyser, the archer. The, the, he's the famous archer. Um, they're, they're all kin, and um, they all know each other's stories. They probably had fist fights and stuff when they were little kids. All of these people, including Agamemnon and Menelaus and their their pecking order was laid out this long is, ago. This this is, by the way, on another topic why I think the American Civil War is the American Iliad. Yes, they're all cousins. They all know each other. They all went to school together. Lee knew Winfield Scott, and Scott knew they they all went to school together. They all knew each other. The pecking order was laid out. Yeah. Uh, I want to point out. About Achilles. So, if you think the the, um, the Iliad gives you a snapshot of Achilles, it's about the rage of Achilles or the mania, the mania of Achilles. It's not the entire Achilles. That they uh, he was well loved. Uh, nobody ever calls him evil. Uh, well respected. Uh, and there's this little detail. So Briseis, who is a war bride, she has been taken, her city has been sacked. Uh, I think, isn't it the same city as Andromache comes from? I think so. The I think, yeah, so maybe they know each other. Um, she's, so you would think she's going to hate him. She doesn't. When Agamemnon sends his, his people to come grab her, uh, Fagel's rendered it. The, the two walked back. Uh, Patroclus is leading her away. Patroclus led her to the lodge and handed her over to the men to take away. And the two walked back along the Argive ships while she trailed on behind, reluctant every step. She did not want to leave him, despite everything. So, um, you know, you're going to see Achilles, uh, people, the moderator, oh, he's just throwing a fit. No, it's more than that. It's much more than that. And 
He is a noble character. He has a greatness of spirit. I would say, in fact, that at his ability not to fight for as long as he does shows the strength of his character. You might not like what he does, but you couldn't have done it. You know, if you were him and you love fighting and you're the best at it, you would have been out there fighting. Ajax says, come on, it's just about a girl. No, it's the principle of the thing. You know, it takes some strength of character to be able to stand on principle and not do the thing that your whole being is telling you to do. Am I way off on that? No. I see you pensive. Uh, I, I'm just being pensive because... Uh, the word for reluctant is involuntary, which will eventually come to be the subject of philosophic examination in Aristotle. Mm -hmm. I, I need, need to, to turn off your Greek. Sorry. How can you do that? It's part no, of it. No, no, keep doing it. I can't do that. Yeah, uh, unwilling. Uh, which isn't quite reluctant, I guess, but unwilling. Well, we've been uh, plying this thing for almost two hours. Um. The couriers come and take the lady away. Um, I mean, it's current year. Should we talk about the fact that um, that these that these men are take these women as spoils of war? What does that mean? You know, here's how I read it. Um. This was not written in 2023. Your, your objections aren't relevant. You have to read it as it is. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be well, confined. Well, there are hostages taken. But it's not anything that doesn't happen now. Right. So what you're saying is Brice has had Stockholm uh, Syndrome? That's not what I'm saying. Whatever oh. Scott says, so what, what you're saying? <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. Dylan. <laughs> <clears throat> this was actually among the aristocracy of this period. This is how mate selection was done. Like there might be some places that do arranged marriage where your family and her family get together and arrange the thing. This is actually how marriage was done. It seems weird to us, but, you know, you, you get the fittest, most powerful husband because he kicks everybody else's ass and takes you. Like, to, for, for Briseis to be the war bride of Achilles was a place of great honor for her. And she actually says it. You know, this is a step down for me to go to Agamemnon. I don't want to do this. No. Mm -hmm. Which, Which again, that's testimony to um, Achilles. My, my little nature argument. You know, she doesn't want to go to Agamemnon, who's only a good by convention. She wants to stay with the best of the Achaeans as she sees it. Because she's going to raise up children to him who will then be greater than than they would have been. In, in Croesus. And uh, no, to our sensibilities, that's, that's weird. But. The, this is what I'm saying. This is humans before all that other stuff happened. You know, take the example of Genghis Khan. You know, what is it? One fourth of the people in the world are descended from him. Right. This is how he did it, and uh, you don't have to like it, but this is how he did it. So, Creasy is, she's going to be taken back to the temple where her dad works. He's a priest of Apollo. Now, maybe Croesus would rather have been with a kiss, perhaps, maybe Helen. So this, is Helen a war bride? It's not clear, right? So, I mean, there's, these are the parallels, right? So, uh, Agamemnon takes a girl from Achilles, which causes Achilles' rage. Paris took a girl from Menelaus, which causes the these rage. So what you're saying? Yeah, it's no. 
what I'm saying, uh, we could accuse them of inconsistency. And uh, I don't think Homer ever screws up. And so when he has this, all this action take place about women being taken, in the background is Helen. And Achilles even says, we're here for your honor, you and your brother, you dog face. Well, what's the, uh, the honor that's at stake for them is that their wife was a, a, a war prize. Paris, Alexander Paris, came to Sparta and grabbed the girl. Sailed away with her and stole, robbed and blind, too. See, either piracy and, and wife-taking is good or it's not. Yeah, and well, it's a, good if you win. No, go ahead, Carl. Sorry. Well, it's good if you win. It's not good if you can't if you lose. You know, it's um, but everybody's doing it. Yeah. To the question that Scott raised that that generated this, it's well, look at the fruits of these practices. Are they actually making these men better? The fact that it's driving them and continuing to drive them into war. And that that sowing discord among them suggests that, you know, as offensive to our contemporary sensibilities it is, the story tells you this is not working for them. Right. There's something about this that's not actually in line with our nature. Um, and I, I did I did a little more Greek digging, uh, just to think you know a little differently too about where where the women and the goddesses fit in with the story. So Athena has a key role. Uh, this is around line. 413, uh, 415, sorry, Math and I are not friends in the Fagel's translation. It's after that line that she read about um, Briseis leaving, and then Achilles weeps. And he says, Mother, you gave me life, me life, short as that life will be, so at least Olympian Zeus thundering up on high should give me honor. But now he gives me nothing. Atreus' son Agamemnon, for all his far-flung kingdoms, the man dishonors me seizes and keeps my prize he tears her away himself all right so a fagel's had disgraces for that second to last line but it's the repetition of the theme of honor and yeah. notice the way achilles is thinking about this my honor should come from zeus but agamemnon is actually taking it away so there's an appeal he needs to make to zeus but he's appealing to his mother first mm -hmm. he sees his mother as his path to honor from zeus Right. Right. So I want to bring up a parallel again. So there's all these parallels in, in Homer that you might not notice. Sometimes they're flipped and sometimes they're pretty direct. But Achilles has had a girl taken away. Christ, he's the priest, had a girl taken away. Christ goes to Apollo and appeals. Achilles goes to Thetis and appeals. Christ gets a plague on the Achaeans. Achilles gets a plague on the Achaeans from the Trojans. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what this means, but I mean there are the similar things happening over and over again. Um, so, uh, Apollo, I mean, uh, Achilles is, you know, begging, please, please make them suffer, just like Chrysis did. Uh, it's like they're all the same person, just in slightly different situations. Is that because Homer... When they make these faces, dear listener, I, I don't know if I've scored a hit or, or not. Is, is that because Homer writes a one-dimensional character? Or is this a rhetorical device? Or is it we're all the same? Oh, I was thinking about that uh, on the my drive today, I was thinking that, that this is just uh, the whole social structure is based on power and it's based on, uh, I mean, justice is the will of the stronger, I think, and uh, how are things going to be conducted in such <clears throat> a situation? If somebody dishonors you, you try to find somebody stronger to make an appeal, and this is the way disputes would be settled. If Agamemnon still is. screws with you, you have to go up the ladder. It still is. You call the sheriff. Yeah, well, but the sheriff can only do this because he's got more guns. It's the will of the you stronger. Um, and they're, they're actually, they're actually, it's really a neat thing here. Uh, the, 
when uh, Achilles is talking to his mother, so this is the bottom of page 90 in Fagel's 470 and following. Uh, there was a time when Zeus was in trouble. And the reason why Zeus owes something to Thetis, uh, whether they had any romantic interest in the past, they probably did. I mean, she grabs his knees. It's a pretty intimate thing. Uh, time and again, I heard you claim your claims in Father's Halls, boasting how you and you alone of all the immortals rescued Zeus, the lord of the dark storm cloud, from ignominious stark defeat. That day the Olympians tried to chain him down. So there was a revolt in the heavens. Uh, Hera of Poseidon, lord of the sea, Pallas Athena, you rushed to Zeus. Dear goddess, broke those chains, quickly ordered, here's where I, I noticed this the first time, quickly ordered the hundred... Uh, the hundred hander to steep Olympus, that monster whom the immortals call Briareus, but every mortal calls the sea god's son, Aegeon, though he's stronger than his father. And immediately I perked up because uh, that's Achilles. Achilles is the one that's stronger than his father. And so that puts Zeus in the position of, I, I don't know how this all works out, but I'm supposed to think this, right? Homer isn't doing this randomly. Achilles is bringing up the case where you got that guy that was stronger than his father to help Zeus, and now Zeus owes you, and here I am. I'm stronger than my father, but I'm not immortal because of that whole deal. And it's just, it's, I haven't figured out what Homer's trying to do with me there, but he's doing something. Yeah, we don't have just, the we don't have the whole story in this you know this Trojan cycle. Yeah, and he uh, so that then he makes the request and he says, um, "Remind him of that now." See, maybe that's to his mom. Look, I know you guys screwed me over. I'm going to mention the one that's stronger uh, than his father. Uh, I I know you guys screwed me over. You owe me. I'm your Briarius. Remind him of that. Now go and sit beside him. Grasp his knees. Persuade him somehow to help the Trojan cause to pin the Achaeans back against their ships, trap them around the bay, and mow them down so all can reap the benefits of their king. So even mighty Atreides can see how mad he was to disgrace Achilles, the rest <laughs> of the Achaeans. That, that, in other words, Achilles is praying that his own companions, fellow soldiers, get killed, which seems hard but then again it's their king if we're going to have a corporate political state then you are responsible for the misdeeds of your king we were back in the heroic age Odysseus or whoever if you pissed me off we would fight it out but if it's going to be Agamemnon with his many soldiers you're all responsible for what he does Am I reaching? No, I, I'm just thinking of, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm just thinking of when the state does things and then we are held responsible for those things. That's all. You know, it's an yeah. unfortunate place to be positioned if, you know, Agamemnon has ships of war and influence and uh, a, a, a grudge uh, because his brother had his woman swept away. And now, you know, you're at the oars of a trireme. Um, or I don't think they're triremes yet. Black peak ships. Yeah. Uh, I just have a ream. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Unireme. Um, yeah, you know Girl, that last line. You how read, much by is the way? it? How uh, much is it their responsibility? Go ahead. Yeah. I was gonna. I was building on Carl's parallels. The last line he read, "The best of the Achaeans," that is what uh, I think Calchas says of Agamemnon earlier when he goes to ask Achilles for protection. Which yeah. again just underscores the conflict between who was actually the good ruler. Yeah. Yeah, are you Team Achilles or Team Agamemnon? My fr my friend Carl, I have caught him in uh, Iliad seminars, 
where he'll ask the people in the seminar, uh, tell me who your favorite and your least favorite character is. And everybody goes around the room and they say, you know, I love Hector and I hate Agamemnon or you know, whatever it is. And then when they're all done, he asks people to, def- uh, to, dis- to, to either defend or I think I've also heard you say, tell us why your least favorite character is good or what is good about that character. Um, yeah. Which is dirty, which is a dirty trick. Um, because there all, are all these par- uh, parallels in here. There are arguments that, you know, Agamemnon is the best of them, and there are arguments that Achilles is the best of them, or Nestor, or whatever. But um, that's why everybody still talks about this darn thing. And that's why people talk about Robin Hood. You know, is he good? Is he good? Is he the best? You know, he's he goes a, from the rich and gives to the poor. He's he's a criminal, but he acts out of a sense of justice that he holds. But um, you know, King John is trying to keep the order t- together. Um, you know, King John and King Richard. I mean, there's an Agamemnon Achilles thing. Um, you know, it's it's these these conflicts and this where you know people's character isn't clear and. Uh, all the lines aren't all starkly drawn that makes these stories live forever and ever and ever. You know, uh, I can I think that the, I think that the Western canon is the canon because, um, because of the ideas, the, the cultural influence and the ideas contained within. And I think it's self, self-referential. I think it, it's self-evident. And you read Nietzsche, he'll list all these things. He'll talk about Homer. You know, you got to go read Homer if you really want to know what Nietzsche's got to say. Um, but Adler said, Adler added to that. He, he said that these books have to be, like, infinitely discussable. You know, they need, they need to have, they need to be, you know, be, beyond depth and I mean, you know, we've done we've done over two hours here on uh, book book one of the Iliad, and I don't know anything about it. Still, I know more than I did, but I don't know anything about it. I, I can make some claims. I'll say Achilles is the finest, and that he's the best. You know, what is the best? Um, but it's it's too much. Uh, what? Well- and it's complicated. He he is the best. He actually is the best. They really do need him. Uh, his um, his his time has not completely passed. I think if you were a Patton and you had your best rifleman in one of the companies and he got offended, you could probably do without him. His impact on your war effort is very small, and so. Uh, personal greatness seems to be less important now could i could i have done without Patton, Patton though could lincoln have done without grant uh no probably not probably not but you know a, a, a grant achilles li- isn't but achilles isn't achilles Achilles isn't Stonewall Jackson. He's not. He's not Patton. He's not leading an army. He's personally killing people. Mm-hmm. It's his personal greatness as a fighter, whose day is nearly over by the time this poem is, by the time the events that the poem describes is happening. It's nearly over. What glory is there in the phalanx? You know, it, it's a. Uh, then the Spartans won. Well, yeah, but which Spartans did great things? They all did. It becomes, I, I've said this, if any of you have been in my seminar, for me, this is like the John Henry story, hmm. the steel driving man against the the drill, the modern drill, and he wins, but he dies. Spoiler. The Achilles is right at that moment where He's 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 already obsolete. Uh, and and uh, it makes me sad. Not it's a strange thing to be sad about. It makes me sad that individual excellence it 
seems to be about ready to go away. Well, is it that it's about ready to go away or that it always goes away? Whether because of bad rulers or divine interference or chance. Yeah, and yeah, and well, and you kind of lose the drama of it. There, there's no for me. There's no because it's always about me. There's no excitement in being a cog in the Agamemnon machine. Okay, so now note that this is all before everything that's comes after, and uh, as Nita as all things are. <laughs> Yeah, Nietzsche talks about this in Genealogy of Morals, and he's not complimentary. Well, he is kind of complimentary about what Christianity does, what it takes uh, the will and turns it against itself so that you can, again, have an arena in which the individual can excel. And so you can be a glorious warrior on in self-control and temperance and prudence and, and uh, following the commandments or something. You know, so but I think the personal glory is always important or it has been important even if you can't, even if it takes a religious turn. You know, Christianity makes it a drama of the individual. Well, it was a drama of the individual until Agamemnon came along and it had to be regained. I know I'm really stretching. Yeah, because we 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 still have. Well, I don't know. Yeah, there there are still realms for excellence in the individual. You know, we've we've mentioned Napoleon, whatever. But it but it wasn't. It's less simple than it than it was for Achilles. Achilles needed to be swift footed, and bold, and. And other things, and then he was excellent. But he didn't ha need to have political cunning. Uh, he didn't have to be a logistician and know how many people, how many you know wagons he needed in the wagon train to feed the Grand Armee. You know, uh, the things that lend to excellence now are, you know, it's quite. It might be clerical skills for Supreme Headquarters, the Allied Expeditionary Force. You know. It's, it's, it's it's not yeah. What is what does good mean? What does excellent mean? Uh, it means the clerks. But that's not this story, right? And by the same token, Nietzsche loves the Greek gods and the genealogy of morals because they look upon the spectacle of human folly and laugh at it in some mm -hmm. cases. Right. They, like us, are spectators of Achilles' deeds and his greatness. And I think maybe the, the harder thing for modern readers to think about is, might Nietzsche be right that the world was a better place when we had tales like the Iliad as opposed to the New Testament? Hmm. That's not a question I'm here to hmm. answer, but when you're reading the Iliad, that's something that you should be thinking about because Nietzsche knows this. He even draws on the etymology of what was used to designate who was good before in the Greek. And it's much truer to what this story says than what it becomes. Uh, okay, so we have um, Homer or New Testament or neither. You know, th that's what I'm saying. There's still the personal drama, I have fought the good fight. You know, there, that's that Paul always often uses athletic imagery in the New Testament. It is a contest. I think Nietzsche is right to point that out. Uh, well, or we, we move beyond that and we discard that and now you're just left with Agamemnon. You're just left with the corporate. For me, that's ick. Yeah, that, that's I, I I don't like. Yeah, but Elon is great at assembling a team of engineers. Yes, 
I mean, well, just, you know, individual achievement is just, yeah. you know, it's just bureaucratic shit now, you know, whatever. There's that. I think that's enough. We're almost there. Uh, there's some interplay between the gods here at the end of book one, and it sets up, you know, the the drama of book two. Book two has the uh, awesome uh, inventory of ships in it. And, uh, oh, good. Uh, I hadn't read this, Carl, and John, I, it's been five or six years, probably five years since I had read this, four years. And... Uh, I'm glad we cracked it again. I think it's been longer than that for me. I'm glad we cracked it again. Uh, it's been like a month for me <laughs> since I read it. Um, it's kind of a constant companion. Uh, uh, but it's good to go over it again and uh, give a different perspective. I'm reading different translations that are just helping me out. To, to go back to what you were saying about how it's the greatest, you know, and it's before... It's before everything. Um, it's before Shakespeare, you know, and um, and I and I love it for that because these characters are not neurotic. You know, I I don't I don't I I'm I'm a simple guy. You know, I don't want to read about um, you know somebody's inner conflict and their self doubts. I just I'm just I don't I'm not interested in it. And I, these are these are more clean characters, you know. This this is more John Wayne than Woody Allen, you know. And I I I just love that about it so much. And I hate Shakespeare for the like legitimization of like the neurotic, you know, Anglo. I, I and so I I, I I like these characters so much more. Carl, what are you doing over there? I'm just. It- Liking Shakespeare, and I'm also thinking of the trailer for Woody Allen's Iliad. Oh my God! Just do theater. Oh my gosh, it's terrible. You know the the mincing, you know, self doubt and worry that you see Albert in the Brooks characters of, uh, in of 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 Shakespeare are just. I, I don't want to read them. You know, I'm not a, I'm not in love with him like I'm supposed to be. Uh, maybe someday we get to Shakespeare. Probably not me. I agree. Same. You agree with which? Shakespeare. Too you, hard on him. I'm too hard on him? Yeah. They're what? great people in his stories, too. How did Shakespeare hurt you, Scott? Um, w- with, with, um... With all the all the mincing soliloquies. I mean, maybe there are great characters in there, but I don't need great characters portrayed in that way. You know, okay. um, if I'm if I'm uh, if it's my republic and uh, Socrates advises me, I banish him. You know, he doesn't re- he doesn't he's not going to betray her, or not going to portray her heroism the way I want I want it portrayed. I'm too simple for that. Okay. <laughs> that's for another. Sh- okay. That's for another. That's stream. for another show. I mean, Hamlet's not really a hero. No, but. You know, there's some. There are heroes, but uh... See, Stephen Dedalus says in uh, James Joyce's Ulysses that Hamlet is Hamnet, the the de- deceased son of uh, William Shakespeare, and that William Shakespeare himself is in the play as the ghost. Hmm. Might be. I posit. I posit that. Uh, Shakespeare modeled the dysfunctional inner dialogue for uh, the West and destroyed the West. All right. There's that. <laughs> uh, are we going to do uh, book two? Uh, are we going to do something else? Uh, what are we gonna we do? could probably chunk a little bit more of it. Um, oh gosh, we might be able to do two through five. Oh, my gosh. It's up to Big John Let's over see. there. We could try a bigger chunk. I need some time. Sure. If we do a bigger chunk, I need time. You say when. Well, at least two and three. I think two hours on the catalog of ships would be hard. Oh, no. Okay, we'll figure it out. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. Uh, stay uh, follow, the, follow the channel, the few of you that are still here. 
uh, like, subscribe, mash the bell, whatever, and um, be, be watching, and I will schedule uh, the next live for, um, on the YouTube channel here, and uh, it'll notify you when that's coming. Thank you, too, man. I appreciate it very much. Pleasure. Thank you. All right, we'll kill it.